Tonight's event has a, an impressive array of panelists and regards the disappearance of the Jewish Library of Rome. As you might have read in our invitation, there were actually two major libraries, Jewish libraries in Rome. One was the rabbinical library, the other one was the library of the community. Uh, two German officers show up a day and look at the, at the books that had been cataloged very accurately in the 30s, I believe. And a few days later, uh, they go and they seize the whole libraries and take them away. The rabbinical library reappeared in 1946 and has been uh, given back to the community. The communal library is lost. And so that, that adds a sort of a mystery uh, to the whole thing. And while I was reading um, parts of the story, I remembered uh, one of the uh, latest novels by Umberto Eco. I don't know how many of you read it. The title in Italian is L'Antica Fiamma della Regina Loana. And it's the story of a, an antique bookseller who, after a car accident, loses his memory. And the only thing he can remember are the bits and pieces of books that he read. Uh, he has, he's surrounded by family, so he knows who he is because they tell him. But the only memory that he has is the memory of the books. And I thought that that was a, a great metaphor also of who we are. We are also, and in grand part, the book we read. And therefore, remembering, like we are doing tonight, the disappearance of the library of a community, not of an individual, so, but it's a library that marked who that community was as a community, as a group of people together with a shared system of values, of beliefs. Um, and I think that's why it's particularly important to devote an evening uh, to this fascinating event. And I'm sure that the members of our panel are going to help us shed light also on the mystery. And without further ado, I would like to ask uh, the director of the Centro Primo Levi here in New York, Natalia Indrimi, to come and introduce our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. You said the essential things on the meaning of this program and the reason why for many years the Centro Primo Levi has been uh, very interested in uh, uh, the fate of the library and understanding uh, why um, the research through over 70 years was so scarce and late. On September 30th and October 1st, 1943, two German officers visited the building of the Jewish community of Rome. They headed to the third floor and um, asked for, to be shown the rabbinical uh, college library and the communal library. The two collections were held uh, together and uh, represented in different ways uh, the history of the one of the oldest, maybe the oldest Jewish community of Europe, and above all, the community that uh, had dwelled in the same city that, was, that had been the that was the capital of Catholicism. So a very uh, delicate history, a very a, a history that was regarded as symbolic um, by not only uh, other Jew European Jewish communities, but also by um, European uh, societies at large. It is estimated that the library contained about 5,000 volumes, include, including valuable uh, manuscripts in Cunabula and Cinque Centine. For reasons that will be the object of further inquiries and uh, of the talks of some of our panelists, the library had no catalog, no formal catalog, with the exception of a very personal list compiled by Isaiah Sonne, a, an Eastern European rabbi and bibliophile who had um, happened to be in Rome during the 1930s and uh, along with another scholar, Attilio Milano, had uh, uh, written up a list of the most significant books of the library. 
Uh, Sonne, in 1940, following the racial laws, fled to the United States, where he lived uh, for many years, uh, teaching at the Hebrew Union College. Interesting enough, we have no recollection by Sonne about, uh, um, that we know of about this event. This panel aims at opening a new avenues of historical inquiry on the content and history of the library as it emerges not only through what we know of the post-war period, but also through the registers of inquisition censorship of community chronicles and other historical sources dating back to the 15th century. I think that this aspect is probably the most uh, original of, um, um, of all the investigations that have been conducted so far, to really look in depth at what this library meant what kind of community it reflected, what kind of community witnessed its disappearance, and what these losses meant over the course of 70 years. And of course, as I said initially, why the library was really never looked for. On that first day of October 1943, the German officers examined the, bo examined the books. On October 11th, so, 11 days later, they returned and announced that the libraries would be seized. Two days later, two German officers walked into the building and, uh, accompanied by a group of uh, movers, transferred the library onto tracks. The accounts of the days vary. Um, I recommend a very um, insightful book by uh, Giacomo De Benedetti, uh, that, that has an, is a, book is pub, there are two books published together, uh, October 16, 1943, and A Jews, which um, has a, a short chapter, but very insightful chapter, on the seizing of the library. In 1946, the Allies located the rabbinical library near Frankfurt and facilitated its, its, its return to Rome in the early 1950s. No trace was ever found of the Jewish communal, uh, the communal library of Rome. Although various investigations were conducted, the last in, in 2002, following a recommendation of the Anselmi Commission on the confiscation of Jewish assets, um, its fate remains obscure to these days. Over the years, hypotheses multiply, and at least few volumes have been found in Holland, and uh, at the JTS library here in New York. But uh, um, no real uh, um, indication of how they arrived to their current location was ever, um, was ever um, defined. The research commission, which was known informally by the name of the then president of the Italian Jewish communities, Dario Tedeschi, as the Tedeschi Commission, was, form was formed by 40 members. 12 political representatives and two historians, Michele Sarfatti, the director of the Center for Contemporary Jewish Documentation in Milan, and Mario Toscano. In spite of very limited resources, the commission's work was the first systematic attempt to establish what was historical data and what family and communal lore. Um, something that is interesting about uh, this, the disappearance and the, the, especially um, the, the testimonies of the day of the looting is that there is a, a tremendous amount of family anecdotic and communal anecdotic that uh, uh, through the years has overlapped and become intertwined with uh, um, historiography, but certainly was, uh, it was a very important step, although it was done very late, to uh, sort out what was one thing and what was the other. I wish to only highlight some <coughs> of the achievements of the Tedeschi Commission. First of all, for the first time, it revisited the events of Rome of 1943 into a European context, and specifically contextualized the looting of the library into the history of the fascist and Nazi project to purge a society from Jewish cultural heritage, and specifically on the history of the attacks of the attack on books. Uh, as we know, starting in 1933, the attacks on books were very symbolic in Germany, and public destruction of Jewish books was one of the first steps of the, um, of the process that led to the extermination project of European Jewry. 
The plan of the Nazis was to create a museum of the extinct race that uh, um, was to be built perhaps in Frankfurt and uh, would have remembered the evil doers of uh, European history. From, there are two important um, elements that as ironic as it might seem emerge from the report. Uh, first of all, there were many European, uh, there were many German agencies that operated in Italy in the confiscation project. Uh, after no November 1943, uh, these agencies operated under the oversight of the Italian police. We don't really know what agreements and what kind of arrangements um, occurred before that date when the looting of the library happened. However, what the commission asserted is that uh, um, the library of Rome was supported by the ERR, the Rosenberg Agency, which was the main uh, <coughs> um, German agency in charge of the plundering of Jewish cultural heritage. And the other important data is that of one of two transports, there is no precise record of departure and no precise record of arrival, although there is an, an indication from a German source that the library that was expected never arrived. Thirdly, we have no record of any kind that indicates the, complete, the possibility of complete destruction of the library, which was brought up many times um, from several sources. There were um, theories that the library might have been bombed. Uh, in truth, the commission has not found any evidence that this was the case. So our speakers tonight will uh, speak about various aspects of this story and uh, I'm going to introduce them one by one. Agnes Perutzeki has been the executive director of the Commission for a Recovery in Europe since 2001. She's a member of the Advisory Council on Nat Nazi Confiscated and Lutal Cultural Property of the European Shoah Legacy Institute and has been a legal instructor at the Provenance Research Training Program and at the Israeli Forum 2014 at Ashava. Perezegi is also a member of the Schwabing Artrove Task Force established to review the artwork found in Cornelius Gurlitz's home, which may have been confiscated by the Nazis to the, from their legitimate owners. Serena Dinepi of the University of Rome La Sapienza is a historian focusing on social attitudes and, of, and religious minorities. She holds a doctorate in early modern history and has published extensively on the cultural and social history of the Jews in early modern Italy. A recent book, Surviving the Ghetto, explores the history and develops, uh, development of Roman Jewish institutions and society during the ghetto era. Dinepi also <clears throat> received a degree in archival science and dig digital preservation. She's part of the editorial board of the Giornale di Storia Moderna e Contemporanea. She's also on part of the scientific committee of the National Jewish Museum of Ferrara. Alexander Karn is assistant professor of history and faculty member at the <clears throat> in the Peace and Conflict Studies program at Colgate University, New York. He's the author of Amending the Past, Europe's Holocaust Commissions and the Legacies of World War II, published in 2015. He's also co-editor with Elazar Barkan of Taking Wrong Seriously, Apology and Reconciliation, uh, published in 2006. His writing has appeared in the Journal of International Affairs, The History Teacher, Law and History Review, and the Austrian History Yearbook. His current work focuses on the use of historical dialogue to promote reconciliation and the emergent right to history. We're really delighted to have our panelists with us tonight, and I hope that this um, event will put the foundation, lay the ground for um, further, further research and further debates on the library, its content, and uh, Jewish history. Thank you very much. Please welcome Agnes Perezeski. Um, 
Dear ladies and gentlemen, I was asked by Natalia to speak about the legal aspects of recovery and how the investigation on the lost library of the Rome Jewish community fits the larger European landscape. But to be able to do that uh, and to talk about recovery, I think I have to give you a short summary on the Nazi looting of books and libraries because it's somewhat different from re uh, general looting practices. I'm sure many of you have seen Monuments Man and read the news regarding art looting in connection to the Gourley Trove recently uncovered in Munich. You may have heard of other publicized cases like the Klimt recovery from Austria of Maria Altman, which is by the way, also a subject of a new movie coming out in the spring. Uh, but in my experience, except for the Schnerson Library, the Chabad Lubavitch Library, uh, there is very little information available about the fate of lost or recovered libraries. Although the story of the lost Roman Jewish library should be a movie project in itself and hopefully after our research, a very uh, open and, and happy ending one. While describing uh, the spoliation of Jewish culture and religious property, including books and manuscripts, which was part of the official Nazi campaign, I'm relying on the scholarship of Patricia Kennedy Grimstead of Harvard University, Dov Sidorsky uh, from Israel, and also the research that's done by the research arm of the Claims Conference led by Wesley Fisher. Between 1933 and 1945, numerous Nazi agencies were responsible for what can be called the greatest theft in the history of humanity. While we have an understanding of a well-organized German effort, and I'm sure all of you heard about the list and the meticulous ways how the Germans deported Jews, uh, the spoliation of the Jewish property was carried out in a less orderly fashion. The main reason for that was the rivalry among competing Nazi organizations who all wanted to take as much as they could. The two main looting agencies were called the Reich Security Head Office, or RSHA, and the Eisenstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, the ERR. The RSHA was primarily active within the German borders. Before it was established, its activities were already carried out by the so-called Special Command Paulson and the Gestapo. The Special Command Paulson, for example, collected the holdings of Berlin, Breslau, Hamburg, Dresden, Munich, and Frankfurt, rabbinical seminaries, and libraries from Krakow, Warsaw, and Lublin. The police also cooperated with the RSHA, and it became one of the more significant agents of the looting of Jewish public and private library collections under the Nazi regime. The other main organization, Looting Cultural Treasures, uh, was the ERR, which was active outside of the Reich's borders along with the Kunzberg Special Command of the German Foreign Office, and starting from 1941, other agencies joined in, the National Archives, the Military Archives, and the Anarab, which was an organization collecting uh, information on archeologically important cultural treasures. If you have seen the Monuments Men, you may remember the infamous ERR collecting the treasures of French Jews. However, Rosenberg activities were not confined to uh, fine art. He had special units for other types of objects. For example, he had one uh, special task force for music and, and he collected musical instruments and scores across Europe. And the ERR also had a special unit for books and these library commandos may have been responsible for the most expensive library plunder ever. However, it should also be noted that precisely because of the looting sprees of the ERR, and especially its ambition to study classified enemy groups, large Judaica libraries and archives, as well as Torah scrolls and ritual silver were saved from destruction. To quote Patricia Grimstead, ironically, many libraries and archives of the victims were saved for the extensive ERR anti-Semitic research, library and propaganda operations. The looting of libraries somewhat differed from general property takings. Nazi Germany needed support in establishing the foundation of its ideology and providing scientific, quote unquote, scientific proof for its validity. And it also needed ammunition to wage a war of propaganda. 
To be able to accomplish all, it founded higher learning institutions and research institutions which needed libraries for their work. As a result, some of these institutions and their employees became looting agencies and looting professionals themselves. In addition to that, these institutions also became the depository of the stolen libraries. For example, as early as 1937, the RSHA planned to establish a library of looted Jewish books, which was called simply the Juden Bibliothek. Part of the libraries taken by the Special Command Paulson and the Gestapo ended up there. But when they had multiple copies, they were often given to other Nazi libraries, such as that of the Wannsee or the Gestapo library. So we can already see that libraries are divided after they arrive in Germany. Books that were classified as political and ideological literature of regime opponents were transferred to the Institute for Research into the Jewish Question in Frankfurt. The Institute was founded in 1939 also by Rosenberg. The main objective was, of the Institute was to assist with the PR of the German Reich and later it was especially involved in the propaganda leading to the final solution. Rosenberg planned to collect Jewish cultural memories at the Institute to justify the Holocaust after Europe would be free of Jews and originally established the Institute to carry out quote unquote professional research. During heavy airline bombings in August 1943, an effort was made to bring the collection of the RSHA to save depositories. While over a million books of the RSHA's book collection were evacuated to the Sudetenland from Berlin, most of the Hebraica books were shipped to Theresienstadt, where Hebrew scholars were assigned to classify and catalog them. The Institute for Research into the Jewish Question also had to be moved in the summer of 1943 for the same reason, and it was moved to Hungen. By 1943, the library already had hundreds of thousands of volumes. Among these holdings were books that came from France, Amsterdam, Brussels, and as far as from Greece. In turn, the Institute became one of the finest Jewish libraries of the continent. The Institute also received loot from occupied Soviet territories, such as Hebraica from Eastern Ukraine and Belarusia. More Judaica came from the Baltics, especially from Lithuania. There were other depositories or institutions receiving Nazi looted books as well. One was the Central Library of the Hochschule, which was also established in Berlin and was later moved to Austria. Additional organizations were, for example, the Institute for Biology and Race Theory in Stuttgart, the Institute for Religious Studies, and the Institute for German Folklore. An additional repository for looted books was Hitler's planned super, uh, supercultural center in Linz, Austria. By the time the war ended, Jewish libraries were moved to many locations. The Germans divided libraries among several depositories and institutions, and when the libraries were evacuated from Berlin, they were moreover split because they were worried that if part would be damaged, at least the other part would be saved. So actually, the Germans were saving the books that they looted from the Jews. The Allied forces paid special attention to books after the liberation and did their best to collect them from the numerous depositories and hideaway places where the Nazis bought the stolen books. Just at the six depositories in Hungen, which was close to Frankfurt, and where most of the books from the Institute for Research into the Jewish Question were carried to safety, about 1.2 million books were collected. Over half a million books were collected in the monastery of Tanzenberg, which was in the British zone. However, books also ended up east and were found in 1945 on the territory of Poland and Czechoslovakia. As a number of books, including a number of Jewish collections, remained in various locations in Berlin, the Soviet army was also able to confiscate them from Berlin and the city's local residents and especially the book dealers also misappropriated from this loot. So if today we have a book uh, on the market miraculously appearing, it's very hard to make a decision just by looking at the particular book of actually what happened to it and where is it coming from. 
1943, in anticipation of the huge amount of Nazi war loot, the United States appointed the Roberts Commission, which established the Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives program. Um, during this program, the monuments men were collecting everything that they found in different depositories, and after sorting out everything, they established four main depositories which were specific. Um, in Munich, Wiesbaden, Marburg, and Offenbach. Offenbach became the depository point when the books were brought. Some of them were also brought to Wiesbaden, but they were mostly the German origin books, and they were returned to Germany. Because of the sheer number of objects held at the Offenbach Archival Depot, identifiable or not, it was commonly called the biggest book restitution operation in library history. The estimate goes as high as three million volumes. American civilian and military leaders had to determine the restitution policy of cultural property, and the decision was to return them to the country of origin where the property was originally taken from as long as uh, it was clear. Uh, they also made the decision not to return uh, objects to individual owners. While this procedure worked relatively smoothly and well for most art objects, there was a problem with returning Judaica to countries. Many of them had basically no Jewish communities left, and also to return uh, books and other valuables to the, former, to the Soviet Union. Uh, at the end, under the leadership of Bernard Heller, millions of books were returned to their country of origin, and those books whose origin was not possible to identify were handed over to the Jewish cultural reconstruction. Uh, just uh, a few sentences about this organization, because it comes up regularly when we deal about looted books. Uh, the Jewish cultural reconstruction was formally established in 1947 because the American organization, the Commission on European Jewish Cultural Reconstruction, only represented American Jewish interests and the Allied forces wanted a Jewish organization that would also include the representatives of the European countries in Israel. Uh, this organization was entrusted to distribute everything that they deemed airless, which doesn't really mean that an object doesn't have an heir. Airless property means that we don't know at a given point in time who the heir is. So anything that was difficult to identify and um, uh, would have taken uh, you know, too much time or there was no hope or the community was thought to be uh, uh, completely wiped out, uh, this organization took the responsibility to distribute them around the world. Uh, many of the books ended up at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Many were, was, uh, many were of course, sent to Israel, to the Jewish National uh, Library, and uh, some of them were distributed to other institutions. Um, some, uh, so far, what I discussed was mainly the US policy. Of course, from the English zone, books were returned the same way. And we know uh, the, what happened to the books that the Soviet Red Army took. Those books uh, traveled back to, uh, mostly to Moscow, and uh, they have not been returned since. I thought that I'll start with this in terms of giving you a background, because I think it's very important to understand when we are looking for uh, the Rome uh, Jewish Communities Library, why the research is so difficult, why, is, uh, why we need a more uh, thought out plan of, of what additional archives to look at, or actually in which country we should even start looking, and why it's very important then when we have a case of uh, a particular object uh, popping up on the market, then it's very important to do full provenance research because without establishing whether that book is actually coming from the lost library or whether that book uh, was the accession before or have a separate history, we don't really know today for sure whether any of the books that were lost in 1943 actually reappeared since. Thank you, Agnes. This was uh, very interesting and very um, comprehensive. It really gave us a sense of what the stakes are and how the history of the search of this library uh, fits in the broader European context and what we are looking 
um, when we, we, uh, we're looking at when we plan uh, a new uh, investigation. I'd like uh, uh, to invite to the podium Ser Serena Di Nepi, who will speak about uh, uh, the library and the community of Rome and their, uh, the, their relation. Please welcome Serena Di Nepi. Good evening. First of all, I would like to thank the Primo Levi Center and Natalia Andrim in particular on behalf of the Jewish community of Rome for inviting, for inviting me to address such an important topic. I say this because we consider the debate on the Loaded Library to be of the utmost importance. Today, um, I shall endeavor to recount this story from a different viewpoint because the library offered an extraordinary extraordinary testimonial of the Hebrew culture of the Roman Jews. Even in the absence of the actual books, the information in our possession allows us to reconstruct a partial yet telling picture of this library. I believe that, I believe that this reconstruction will help us realize what exactly was lost for the community and how serious this loss it has been, as Natalia said before. Two collections of books were in the library in 1943. They reflected a process of acquisition and conservation of Hebrew books dating almost back to the 13th century. These books had survived until the 1940s, more or less intact in spite of persecutions and restrictions to which Roman Jews were subject for centuries. I will dwell on the bibliographical heritage that still exists and on the clues that it offers us with regard to what is missing, on what is no longer there but about which we know a few things, and lastly, on what we can only imagine thanks to information that surfaces from the archives, including, as ironic throughout it may sound, records of the Roman Inquisition and the Index, both of which are kept in the Vatican. I will attempt to describe the cultural life, the interests, the studies, and the teaching that sustained the Roman Jews in their Jewishness throughout their long history, a phenomenon which depended also on the books that the libraries active in the ghetto proved capable of preserving, using and expanding over the centuries. To achieve my purpose, I will examine first the book describ described in the catalog of Isaiah Sonne compiled in written in 1934, and then the Giovanni Antonio Costanzi Index of Jewish Books, uh, which describes over 700 titles discovered in Italy's ghetto and considered problematic in 1742. I begin with the Sun Catalog. The Jewish library, or rather, as we have seen, uh, the two Jewish libraries looted in Rome between October and December 1943, had no modern, up-to-date catalog. I shall return to examine the reason for this seeming unbelievable definitions later on when I discuss the censorship of Jewish books from 16th to 19th century. Working in the archive and the library for only three days in the company of Attilio Milano in 1934, Isaiah Son compiled a partial and subjective description of the material that was shown to him, highlighting certain aspects of it that are worth recalling. Attilio Milano was the historian and the archivist of the community. He invited the son, a friend of him, and a well-known philologer and historian to have a look both, both on the library and the archive. The catalog by Isaiah Son was the result of their cooperation. As the son himself tells us in the first few lines of his report, the encounter with the Roman books proved to be the of the utmost interest, but it also proved to be something of disappointment for him. Sorry for it. I, every time I'm be very anxious when I speak English. <laughs> Sorry for him. The collection was a welcome surprise, but he believed that he had been granted access only to the second choice volumes 
to quote his own word, this is the beginning of the quotation, I say second choice because various circumstances prevented me from viewing either the famous biblical codices, which had been jealously guarded in the safe for years or the 20, or so in Cunabola, recently removed from the library and stored along with those biblical codices. End of quotation. So as early as in 1934, for various reasons which were never explained to Son, but on which we may formulate a number of hypotheses today, the community did not make available its most valuable codices as if it considered them endangered. The fact that they had just decided to store another 20 in Conabola in the safe suggests that there was a belief on of an impelling danger not even a respected scholar and a friend of the community historian Attilio Milano, who worked with the son in those three days, was allowed to personally view the most important books. Prior to this episode, in 1895, a list of the books of the confraternity of the Talmud Torah was compiled before the collection was incorporated in the main community library. You must remember that in 1895, the ghetto was finished, the Italy was unified, Rome became the capital of Italy, and for the first time the Jews of Rome was, were planning about the building of the new big synagogue that, that now everybody knows if, if, if you go to Rome. Before we have a, another situation, when they built the, com the, 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 commu the new community building and the new big syn the new synagogue, they organized the movement of fine art objects and uh, of books. And these in within this frame, there was, um, they prepared this particular description of the books of the Talmud Torah. This list, uh, including only 3,156 books, was drafted in Hebrew using Italian rabbinical italic script and later updated with uh, two appendices dated uh, 19 uh, and 1902 respectively. It is not a catalog in the real sense of the word because it contains only the titles and the press mark of the books, uh, but does not list the authors, the city and the year in which they were printed. Son and Milano's experiences at the Library of Rome provide a few elements of inquiry. In 1934, the community was uh, reticent to show its most precious volumes and, in fact, indefinitely postponed the production of a catalogue. One could argue that the memory of over three centuries of persecution of Jewish books was uh, still operating in the midst set of Roman Jews, who considered it safer and thus preferable not to possess any accurate list of the books that they owned. Few years later, However, something prompted a hastily communal resolution to produce a catalogue. The current state of the research does not allow us to establish what caused this resolution. Natalia and Rimi suggesting that it, I think it's a very good idea that during the years of the dictatorships, books in libraries and commercial circulation were carefully vetted by censorship, and that after the invasion of Ethiopia in 1936, racial consideration became increasingly present on the work of fascist censors. Between 1934 and 1936, the government secretly took the first census of Italian Jews. Both factors speak to the tenuous condition under which the Jews lived. In 1938, the Jewish community of Rome entrusted Hungarian rabbi Fabian Herskovitz with the compilation of the library's catalog. However, the promulgation of Russian laws prevented Herskovitz from beginning the work as, to the expulsion decree of foreign Jews, he was forced to leave the country. Thus, our most important work of reference today is still Sons catalog, which was compiled exclusively on the basis of second choice work in the space of only three days. Sons catalog lists 26 manuscripts and 220 printed works out of an estimated total of around 5,000 to 5,000 uh, 5, books. 
the catalog concerned only the Jewish community library. In other words, the library put together with books from all the libraries active in the ghetto until 1870, namely the libraries of the scholar, the congregations, and more especially the library belonging to the confraternity of the Talmud Torah. The other library that was looted, the Italian Rabbinical College Library, requires a separate treatment. After the war, this is the library that was recovered in part at the Offenbach depot and returned to Italy. Sonnet div divided his catalog into five categories of entry, manuscripts in Cunabula, works printed by the Soncino brothers, 16th century Levantine prints, and the books he consi considered of a unique nature. It is worth pointing out that Sonne added the last three categories, which are somewhat unusual in a library catalog and all of which are related to printed work, after he realized he could not see some of the books. Sonne had hoped to see grammatical works of the circle of Egidio de Viterbo, which he did not find or which were not made available to him, and decided to highlight other interesting aspects of the collection. With the regard to the manuscripts, Son stressed that at first sight this was second-class material, in other words, not the most famous works, but texts not worthy, in part for their, and I'm quoting, for their local character, and thus I'm quoting again, held to be of little account, to be point where they were not deemed to deserve a place alongside the biblical codices and in Cunabula, or even worth the money required to have them catalogued. This uh, local character is crucial to our own purpose, and so we should examine it a little more carefully. On the one hand, these manuscripts, from the scholar and the ghetto and the, of the, and the confraternity of the Talmud Torah, would appear to point up the interest surrounding the debate, the study and the conservation of a unique Roman custom, while, on the other, the absence among these same codices of a manuscript of the Roman prayer's book, the Mahazor, seems to point to the opposite direction. As the son himself points out, it is likely that wherever a printer edition replaces the manuscript, the latter tended to gradually disappear. The replacement of manuscripts with the printed works in the ghetto is not surprising. The lack of space, strictly oversized, censorship and confiscation all made life difficult for private collection and this consideration played a crucial role in the establishment of libraries during the ghetto years. The notes on ownership, sale and copying in several of the books quoted by Son tell meaning meaningful stories with the women playing the leading role in several of them. Of the utmost importance is the volume indicated by the number 22. Sefer Zikronot, Book of Memories, Regulation of the Library of the Talmud Torah in Rome, with a catalog drafted between 1718 and 1791, followed by another drafted in 1816. These books, uh, as the title says, refers to a catalog drafted after the looting of 1733, to which I shall be returning later on and composed at a time when, on a more general level, interest in archives and libraries was increasing in the church state. A long series of descriptions of archives concerning numerous Roman institutions, including, of course, the city's Jewish institution, dates back to this era. The next volume, number 23, goes into greater detail. I say, I'm quoting again, Index of the archived documents and summary of the decrees of the community, the Keila Kadosh, done in the year 1718, mostly written in Italian, but the summary of the Jewish books is written in Hebrew. The index, like the summary of the books, begins at the start of the 17th century. It is significant that among the first deliberation deliberated, we find one dated 1617, which states, Whoever owns writing, writings referring to the community is bound on pain of karam, the excommunication, to hand them over by, so that this from this day on all the members may use them. I'm 
this is the end of the quotation. The deliberation was confirmed in 1639 and tells us of the time when the community's public collection were put together, although the books for personal use, such as prayer books, were obviously excluded from this process. It is difficult to be sure exactly what was meant by writings referring to the community. What transparent from this process is that the books were regarded as a communal assets and therefore entrusted to the collective care of the group rather to the than to the individuals. The difficult circumstances besetting the leaves of the Jews in the Roman ghetto did not prevent collections from being formed and preserved over time, and even less did they prevent the careful daily use of books for leaning. For years, the Jews of Rome were portrayed as deeply rooted in their city, but condemned to ignorance by the isolation and poverty of life in the ghetto. An analysis of the Rome Jewish library and its genesis disproves the images once and forever. The second main category of San Catal catalog are the incunabula. They included, and I'm quoting again, a Portuguese incunabulum of 1494, extremely rare, and an equally rare Hebrew-Italian-Arabic dictionary printed in Naples, in Naples in 1488. The presence of this text in Rome is hardly surprising. In the city the that was to welcome Leo Africa, I don't know if you read the wonderful books by Na Natalie Zemon Davis that tells the history of uh, an African, of uh, Muslim slaves in Rome. This is the history. And uh, Rome has, uh, during the Renaissance, a lot of uh, intercultural dialogue and circle of uh, made up by humanists. And this is the same case. We have this uh, wonderful dictionary. As we shall see, relation with the Ottoman world went on uninterrupted. Dictionary of this kind were in circulation, and therefore Jewish libraries had to have their own copies. A large part of these incunabula were intended for both individual and collective study. These, some says, tell us that we are dealing with the genuine collective heritage of the community, whose culture, cultural level it reflects and that these books did not just get here by chance. The incunabula constitute the backbone of the official learning. As I mentioned earlier, the last three catalogues categories are unusual and were defined by some specif specifically for the Roman library. The selection of Soncino's printed work is outstanding in terms of quanti quantity, comprising at least 25% of the so Soncino's entire output and includes first edition published in Istanbul. The Italian geography of printing reflects the Soncino's brothers' peregrination. Wherever they went, the brothers would set up print shops and print texts on commission, including municipal statutes, books, pamphlets, and of course, the beautiful works in Hebrew that made them famous, and which were funded by the printing business conducted for their Christian cli clients. With the establishment of the Christian printing works of Justiniani and Bragadini in Venice, which were in endless competition with one another, the Italian market became difficult for the Soncinos. The family moved to the, Ottoma to the Ottoman Empire. The situation in Turkey was very different, with virtually no competition. In fact, the printing in, Arab in Arabic came fairly late to the Islamic regions, starting early in the early 19th century. Prior to this, Printing in the Ottoman area was limited to books in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin for a Jewish and Christian audience. Ironically, up to the 19th century, printing in Arabic was done mostly in Western Europe, primarily with missionary purposes. The Roman library had at least 48 editions printed in the 11th before 1614. This is a considerable number. These 48 printed works uh, describe trading and communication networks between the Jewish community and the Levan in a period when the Latin conflicts between the Christian and Islamic world ignited frequent, uh, frequent clashes. While Venice specialized in printing classical texts, the most innovative work came from the Levant. The lengths to which Roman Jews went to obtain them, possibly through their channels in Ancona, connected to Smyrna, Salonika, and Constantinople, testify once again to the cultural levelness of the community and to its full participation in the Jewish network or the Sephardic of the Sephardic diasporas. 
The fifth and final group identified by Son is comprised of interesting volumes, as he said. In other words, that 101 printed works that he found most impressive. It is interesting to note that many of these volumes are Talmudic treatises, which, while not whole due to the censorship, were nevertheless present in the, community, in the community's library. This brings us uh, directly to the second aspect, uh, which I intend to discuss, namely the impact of censorship and, uh, and of the hindrances of forbidden Jewish books uh, on the establishment of the library. The Roman Catholic Church has traditionally regarded Jewish book, books with suspicion. The Talmud has always been the main but not the only focus of the Church's concer concerns. The list of suspicious books is fairly extensive, ranging from the Talmudic dictionaries to treaties, formal teachings, and the Kabbalistic volumes, which were considered responsible for fostering superstition and magic. During the Middle Ages, Jewish books were banned frequently. In 1553, on the morning of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year Eve, the spectacle of the public burning of the Talmud was offered to the people of Rome in the central square of Campo de Fiori, the same of Giordano Bruno. This public event marked the beginning of a process that culminated in 1596 in the compilation of an X index of Hebrew books uh, known as the Zikuk by historian, which was updated by Giovanni Antonio Costanzi in 1742. Indices of Hebrew books were compiled in accordance with the usual rules of censorship and divided into books to be condemned and purged, and books that required revising. Phrases that needed to be cancelled or altered were scrupulously noted down, page by, page by page and line by line. In charge of this work, the Roman Inquisition, which worked jointly with the Congregation for the Ixen, carried out with great zeal. It is interesting to note that uh, the manuscript that is a number under number 12 in Son Catalogue, that, and that is uh, now at the Jewish Theological Seminary uh, Library, has, a, mm, has at least three different notes by, by three different censorship in three different <coughs> dates, uh, and that this particular is not mentioned by Son in his catalogue. It is interesting for us because uh, the notes made by censorship tell could tell us something more about a book that we can find wherever in the world, uh, about the Roman or at least the Italian background of, the, of a book. Even if we have no seal, no stamps, nothing about the real origin of the books, the notes by censors could tell us something that it is interesting to note. The process took place as follows. An initial overview was conducted when the books entered the territory of the papal states, of the papal states where they were checked and then authorized by the Maggiordomo del Sacro Palazzo. Unfortunately for the cultural history of Italy, the, Maggiordom the Maggiordomo archive vanished, probably in Napoleonic times, and so we no longer have the list compiled by the papal states custom officer. This procedure applied to all books arriving in Rome, but those that entered the ghetto were subject to further surveillance. Police searches were a daily occurrence for Roman Jews. Each time they buried the policeman, took books, boxes of books away for verification. These books were not always returned to the rightful owners, despite the lively, pr the lively protests that they presented to the relevant authorities. Naturally, with every search, the authorities invariably found books that had been banned or pages, or pages that had not been correctly purged. The Jews, on their end, always devised new strategies, strategies to ensure the cu their cultural survival, both by continuing to bring book books into the ghetto that should not have been brought in, and by orally handing down the passages with the churches at purged, and which were often preemptively purged by the rabbis themselves after 1554. This explains certain features of the Roman community's library. First of all, it tells us why they were libraries held communally, and why, as we have seen, since the early 17th century, personal ownership of books was discouraged. It is more difficult to weed out out unwanted pages from thousands of books than from a few dozen. Also, it suggests a reason for the product manner in which the community acted and in connection with its heritage, always postponing the compilation of a modern catalogue. 
In addition to this, it further explained the preponderance of books for study, liturgical texts and treatises in the collection, which served as a basis for training and education. In recent times, Rabbi Alberto Piattelli conducted a survey showing that Sonne catalog included only books that were deemed acceptable by the, the censors. The Inquisition archives, however, indicated many questionable books were discovered in the ghetto of Rome, suggesting that Roman Jews were tenacious in defending their cultural, their culture and their identity ag against external aggression. Ironically, the record of that systematic aggression may provide for us essential information on the books we are looking for. In the absence of a complete catalog and in the event of uncertainty over the stamp, the censorship notes provides important clues as to the books that form the looted library of, Ju of Rome. Only few books survived the looting since, as I say, had been hidden. They were all censored with preci precise annotation on more than one occasion between 16th and 18th century. And in many cases, Son himself mentions the notes, but not in all cases. The names of famous censors and the dates provide unquestionable evidence that numerous volumes came from. Also, we should note that the Sant'Uffizio kept meticulous records of the titles of confiscated books, with all the details on the authors and on the cities in which they were printed. The, studies, the study of these lists of confiscated words could help us reconstruct, at least virtually and only as far as printed books are concerned, the lost library. Now, let us turn briefly to the surviving volumes that we were looted. We do not know who decided to hide them, when they were hidden, nor how they were selected. In fact, we are not even certain that they are the same valuable codices that were never shown to Sonne. These books represent a kernel of what was lost and reflect the concerns, the perceptions of the past and the outstanding nature of the Roman Jewish library. I conclude on a positive note announcing that the Jewish Museum of Rome is planning an exhibition on the library based on these volumes that will inaugurate in Rome for International Holocaust Rem Remembrance Day of the next year and will come to, the, to New York after. The exhibit will tell the story that is hopefully to be continued. Thank you. I'd like to thank Serena Di Nepi for this uh, beautiful presentation that uh, gives us uh, um, some uh, food for thought. I think both presentations uh, allow for uh, interesting parallels in terms of the history of the persecution of the books, how it happened, and whether there might have been an interest um, fetishistic interest uh, or an histo natural historical interest um, in the way in f by on, 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 the on the part of the Nazi <coughs> persecutors of the book con on the concerning the, the way in which Roman books had been persecuted in the past. I'd like to invite to the podium Ad Alex Karn, who will uh, comment on both um, on both presentations, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here, and uh, I want to thank the organizers for uh, extending the invitation. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, yeah, I have two small children and two... Uh, <laughs> adventurous cats and so um, in my home sleep is not what it could be. <laughs> um, so I relate to this uh, Echo character who only remembers the fragments of a few old books. Somehow the way my mind is, is uh, structured these days. Um, I, I've been asked to uh, give some comments o on these papers and uh, and, and talk about the, the Stolen Libraries Commission um, in the context of a larger trend. Um, my, my recent work is a comparative study of, of Holocaust commissions, um, 13 of them. Um, this was not uh, uh, one of those 13, but uh, I'm familiar with the report and have read it. So um, I want to 
talk to you first about a kind of larger trend uh, to which this commission, I think, belongs. The United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. maintains a list of, of Holocaust-era assets activities with uh, approximately 150 different initiatives, most of them originating in Europe. Uh, most of these uh, have been oriented toward property restitution and to uh, the tracing and recovery of plundered assets, including artworks and other cultural properties. My research uh, focuses on a, a subset of these initiatives, um, which are the historical clarification commissions, or sometimes uh, called the commissions of uh, historical inquiry. Um, there were several dozen of these during the 1990s and uh, 2000s. Some of them were official governmental commissions. Uh, others uh, arose through um, uh, through uh, uh, NGOs and other unofficial channels. Most of these commissions were, were national commissions, uh, but there are uh, also bilateral and multilateral commissions uh, for us to consider as well. Uh, my interest in the commissions uh, extends beyond the clarification and fact-finding missions they take on. I'm concerned primarily with how these commissions navigate between competing memories of the same events. Uh, the questions I ask relate to the potential of these commissions to contribute to conflict mediation, uh, which obviously isn't the only way or even the fairest way of assessing their work, just one way, uh, which I've taken upon myself. Uh, what I mean here is that these commissions have tended to define their work in one way, uh, while my critiques, I think, pertain to what they could potentially accomplish if they were to rethink their overall approach to the past. Uh, to put this more, more concretely, I'm interested in what the historical commissions can contribute to historical justice, uh, but of course there are uh, different conceptions of justice for us uh, to consider and different ideas about how historical scholarship can contribute to justice. Restitution, which aims to recover stolen property and, and return it to its rightful owners, is certainly one important realization of justice. Reparations, which aim to establish responsibility for past crimes and garner compensation for the material losses of victims, is another valuable approach. My conception of historical justice, however, is uh, different. Uh, in addition to restitution and reparations, I'm interested in how engagement with the past can support a process of moral reckoning, which I argue cannot occur without a serious effort at recovering the lived experiences of the victims. In other words, I'm interested in the con contribution that historical narrative and memory can make to justice and in the ways that historical interpretation can buttress efforts to address the material aspects of Holocaust era crimes. I want to make a few uh, general points about the, the work of these, these commissions. The, uh, the Stolen Libraries Commission, uh, in my mind, is exceptional in terms of how much new insight it gained and the kinds of leads it produced. While the commission did not succeed in recovering the books it was looking for, a good deal was learned about the mechanics of looting and plunder and about the relative merits of various hypotheses concerning the ultimate fate of these books. The Commission's final report describes these achievements uh, modestly. The research, according to the report, quote, throws a few gleams of light on the looting, paving the way for further research. Uh, it's a bit too modest from my perspective. Um, compared to the many historical commissions that I've uh, looked at, the Stolen Books Commission, I think, learned a great deal that was new. In fact, few of the Holocaust commissions uh, managed to unearth previously unstudied documents. Very few of these commissions make any kind of uh, uh, earth-shattering finds. Um, it's more often the case uh, that these, uh, these commissions look at uh, documents which have been previously studied already, and so the fact-finding dimension of these projects is, I think, frequently overstated. The majority of historical commissions 
have found the facts which were known to historians already, which of course it doesn't mean that their efforts were for naught. The best historical commissions, I argue, aren't necessarily the ones that leave the archives with a trove of secret documents. Rather, some of the best work has entailed recontextualization for facts which were already known, but whose meanings have been contested. The best historical commissions have linked Holocaust-era plunder to the genocidal killing which such thefts facilitated. The Stolen Books Commission report asserts that systematic looting of European Jews was pursued by the Nazis, quote, in addition to their extermination. These two phenomena, the looting and the killing, are set alongside each other, but the relationship is still, I think, um, ambiguous. The commission says in its report simply that the plundering was part of a wider political, ideological, and cultural agenda. Other commissions have uh, pursued this point more explicitly and more directly. In France, for example, the Mattioli Commission asserted that Jewish spoliation was more than mere plunder. It was rather what the commission described as, quote, a preface to genocide. As Antoine Prost, one of the Mattioli historians, put it, spoliation, quote, spoliation was not just to eliminate Jewish influence in the national economy and to raise billions, it was also by specific design used to deprive the livelihood of thousands of ordinary people and make life physically impossible so as to make them literally disappear from the landscape. Of course, there are important differences between the French and Italian cases, and I don't suggest here that responsibility for the Holocaust can be ascribed equally to all. I only mean to say that our understanding of the Holocaust in Italy runs into problems if we disaggregate the events of late 1943 from some of the earlier history and, and for that matter, some of the later history. Something else to consider, which I alluded to already, is the tendency of these commissions to focus on material losses and financial accounting as opposed to lived experience. Uh, Italy's Stolen Books Commission had a specific mandate to investigate the circumstances under which these books were plundered and to reconstruct the path taken by these collections after they were removed. This is, of course, important work. These were not just any old books. But if we look at other commissions and compare their work, we start to see what I would characterize as an obsessive interest in material losses material damages, and the accounting exercises that aim to produce estimates of these losses. Now again, I, I don't mean or wish to minimize the importance of, uh, of this work and this commission, uh, and I've said already that we really have to contend with the question of spoliation if we wish to understand the full scope of the Nazi extermination program. On the other hand, Overemphasis on material losses silences other important aspects of Holocaust history, including some that are crucial to a deep conception of justice. The poster child for this, this narrow economic approach to the past is, uh, I think, Austria's Jablaner Commission. Uh, when we look at that report, virtually everything there uh, relates to shillings or Reichsmarks, dollars, etc., while almost nothing in the report communicates uh, the traumatic experiences of victims. The best example, I think, is the Commission's work on Kristallnacht, uh, which the Commission presents as an assault on Jewish property. The Yablino report provides estimates for the, numbers of, for the number of Jewish businesses damaged, the number of shop windows broken, the total area in square meters of all shattered glass, the insured values of these panes, which of those bro broken panes was the subject of an insurance claim, and, and so on. 
Whereas others who have studied Kristallnacht have used diaries, personal letters, and medical re records to document a spike in suicide among Jews immediately following these attacks, the Yablina report is silent on this aspect of the pogrom. This narrow emphasis on financial damages, which I have called a forensic approach to the past, imposes a moral structure on the events it attempts to understand. The Yabliner Commission determined that broken glass and stolen furniture were compensable, whereas terrorizing one's neighbors in an open display of racial hatred, to the point that many Jews contemplated or committed suicide, was not. This is an example of how methodological choices and historiographical orientation can silence key aspects of the past, even where the exercise is explicitly oriented toward clarification. When Clemens Jabliner, the, the, the chair of the Jabliner Commission, spoke to the media about the final report, uh, he said that the facts it contained would, quote, speak for themselves. In making this statement, Jabliner, I think, was attempting to raise the enterprise above the level of politics. This was his way of making a claim for scientific objectivity. But again, my claim is that the commission's dry recitation of uncontroversial facts connotes a moral message, or rather, it signals a moral evasion, an unwillingness to contemplate the full meaning of the facts which it assembled. Other commissions have uh, run into the, more or less the same problem. Um, in France, uh, Claire Andrew, who served on the, on the Marioli Commission there, uh, has described a strong feeling of discomfort at having to approach the past through a, quote, scientific mode, which she says relies on statistics, percentages, dates, financial, and legal jargon. According to her, a more appropriate approach to the past would entail what she called, quote, a more sensitive discourse. Now, one of the questions I think we, we might wish to pursue tonight is, is what, what that might entail, what a more sensitive discourse um, might offer. Um, at the risk of uh, sounding somewhat melodramatic, uh, my, my proposition is that a, a more sensitive discourse would focus on agony. This would be the agony of victims and their descendants on one side. Uh, on the other side, it would entail an agonizing confrontation with moral responsibilities. I don't push here for an accusatory narrative or one that insists on collective guilt. Rather, my interest lies in the development of an explanatory narrative, one that clarifies the record, documents the truth, confronts partisan narratives, which use history irresponsibly to embed the past within an ideological framework. It would facilitate justice through a process of mediation and negotiation, it would raise the question of redress and open possibilities for mutual understanding. This kind of history, I argue, would have a, a reparative effect in itself. Uh, I'll stop there, and I think we have lots of time for Q&A, and uh, appreciate the chance. Thank you, Alex. This was very interesting. I'd like to invite our guest to sit on the podium, so on the stage, so that uh, um, we can uh, have uh, that we have. Very good. So. Um, Unless someone has questions in the audience. Here we have one, and then we'll. Uh,
my question basically is that of the cataloging of the books that were contained in the Rome Jewish Library, that was handled specifically by the Jewish community, correct? Yes. Okay, and then my next question is, so what did the fascists, what was their role as opposed to the Germans in terms of confiscating this property and l taking it out um, of Rome and for that matter, out of Italy? I am not an expert on fascist area. Uh, for the, as far as I know about the Jewish community of Rome, it was a, a matter of days. And the fascist has no direct involvement in the looting of the library. There were a... Um, there was a, a transport, a transportation a moving company. Yes, that was an Italian one, and that. Well, sorry, which was the official, official moving company of the Ministry of the Interior, <laughs> which <laughs> I don't know. It, I think gives a. Exactly, but it, they, we know that uh, the um, Jewish community um, leaders try to have asked for help to the Italian uh, government uh, and maybe to some other and they didn't res they na never received an answer from the Italian government at the moment but the f the beginning of the action was uh, by the Nazi I think that it would be inter I mean there are a few connections here that your question brings up and one is uh, uh, Alex spoke about the, the, the Library Commission, which was really the result of the Anselmi com Commission on the confiscation of Jewish assets, which was a, a commission that in 1997 uh, was ordered by the, uh, was created by the government to um, investigate and uh, document the confiscation of Jewish assets that had been carried out by the Italian government from 1938 to 1945. So this, um, this is a very important step and uh, it, does, it did follow the documentation of the victims. So the, just for, to give a, a, a sequence also in terms of what Alex said. In, ter in terms of the participation of the, of the fascist police, the reality is that we don't know. We, even the, 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 com the, 2000, the 2002 commission has not investigated, has not looked into the archives to see whether there is documentation. What we know is that the Italian prefecture, the Roman authorities were uh, highly collaborative. It was one of the most radical collaborationist uh, prefecture in Italy, and uh, certainly s provided Kepler with a tremendous support system, both officially and unofficially. Uh, Caru, the prefect, prefect Caruso, uh, pu certainly put at, at uh, the German at Germans' disposals his, his uh, resources, and uh, there were uh, bands like the Koch band, which. Um, you know, made the, the had the role of um, of uh, you know militia and un, un, uncontrolled militia, but really worked for the German SS. So it it was a situation of of uh, of great difficulty in which the Jewish community did not have an, an a real interlocutor. And also, and these are the two weeks in which the blackmail of the gold. Where the, the Roman Jews were asked for 50 kilos of gold to spare the community from deportation, and so that's the, these are the two. And these were the two weeks bef before October 16th, in which uh, the this negotiation is is uh, carried out. So we don't we we don't know, and this is certainly one of the lines that uh, should be investigated. We don't know, I mean, we know that uh, both the president of the Jewish community of Rome and the Union of Italian Jewish Communities had um, exchanges with the Vatican, but we don't know what they were, and with the minister, Italian Minister of Culture, but we don't know what the, we don't have any record of it. 
Natalia, if I may, uh, what Agnes was saying also is that the, the difference in the destiny of the uh, fine arts patrimony and, and the book patrimony is very different. And um, the question is very interesting because, for example, in Ilaria Danini Bray's book, The Venus Fixers, in which she basically examines in, in great detail all the records of the dialectical relationship between fascist authorities and Nazi occupants regarding, for example, the uh, exportation or the transportation of Italian works of art from Italy to Germany. It's very interesting to see how these very uh, orthodox fascist uh, officers on a certain uh, level have these divided allegiance between being Italian and not wanting the Italian patrimony to leave the country and at the same time being allied of the Nazis. So in some cases she was able, regarding the fine arts though, I, I, I've never read anything about the books. The books are less visible. Books are in library that are closed uh, spaces. But there is a very interesting line of research there because it's, it's proven that for the, for the monument uh, mm, holdings, the paintings, the sculptures, there were some of these prefects that were government authorities appointed by the fascists, ultra-fascist, at a certain point decided not to obey the specific orders that they received from the Nazi occupants. But for the libraries, I really think that remains a great field of investigation, if I'm correct. Well, I, Stefan, I would say that uh, it's, uh, Ju Jewish libraries were a good pawn also, and we cannot, with a good way to appease the Germans. And because this we was. see in many confiscations mm -hmm. all over Italy. But technically, after November 30th, the Italian authorities oversaw, except for the Adriatic littoral, Italian authorities oversaw all confiscations. The big um, questions between the Germans and the Italians were in, in the areas, in the special, you know, in areas of special uh, war concern, like the Adriatic littoral in Trieste, Venice, in that Fiume. But and, and I have another question. I don't know for Serena, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm from Mantua, and the specific case of the Jewish Library of Mantua, that is one of the most prestigious ones, especially for scientific and Kabbalistic texts, that remain intact simply because it was given in deposito by the Jewish community of Mantua to the public library of Mantua, and then somebody there uh, didn't include it in the official catalog, so there was no record in that moment that the library was there. So that was spared and that's the reason why it's still intact. I wanted to know whether there is a record of any other similar case in which special uh, dealings between the local Jewish communities and local library authorities or, or local city authorities were able to save uh, Jewish libraries or if it's a unique case for Mantua. Even in Rome, they gave something to the Casanatense library. And there is probably something that, I I among the few books that, are, that survived uh, the, the, the winter of 1943-1944. I think that even for this case, we need to come back to the Ro particular Roman experience. It's hard to think that Roman Jewish communities could uh, trust uh, public library in Rome that at the moment were public but had an, an ancient cath Catholic origin. Uh, all these very important public library in Rome that are the Catanatense, the Angelica, the Vallicelliana library, and all of this library has today very important Jewish collection of ancient prints and incunabula today, are libraries uh, that uh, were made up by cardinals uh, in the ancient times. So I think that for Rome, the idea of a difficult memory to a very recent past is important to understand what they, di what they did and what they didn't want to do. Thank you, Natalia. Are you aware of any other case in it of Italian libra Jewish libraries saved with this particular negotiation between local communities and local library or local authorities? Mm -hmm. Or Mantov is one? No, I think Exception. Mantua is, is specific. Uh, Verona had s some part, a part of the library hidden. Um, I don't think in another library, but with uh, the, the help of uh, um, local authorities. 
Um, I'm not aware of many others. However, there are um, many other Italian books, Jewish books, May that I have not returned. They, in Rome, they succeeded in hiding the silver and the textiles. So they, had, they decided to hide something, and they decided to prefer the, the art, the fine art collection that were really important. Thank you. an interest of the Vatican to preserve such uh, texts. Uh, is there, uh, I is there uh, a trace uh, that the books actually left Rome? Well, there, uh, part one transport is really not documented. It is not documented arrival. There we have a letter from the German sources saying that the library was expected but did not arrive and is not documented at departure. <laughs> so. <laughs> this is one of the most important questions. I'd like to ask uh, Agnes, if possible, um, from. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, a lot of the documentation, the problem is that when the first, when, after the war, there was no proper investigation. So we don't, we, like, it's not that the police went to Otto Rosoni, which was the official mover of the Minister of the Interior, and said, Otto Rosoni, we're going to seize your, your documents because we want, no, nobody did this. So all we have is a letter from the director who says, we did this and we didn't want to do it and uh, it was bad and maybe, you know, it, 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 there is very little hard evidence of what may have, have happened. And certainly the Italian authorities have not volunteered. I mean, it is uh, kind of uh, puzzling that when you read this uh, report that was very well done, in fact, for what could, could be done in 2002, there is not one piece of documentation from Italian archives and Italian police, Italian carabinieri, Italian uh, prefecture, and Italian minister of culture, who, which we know was contacted by the community. So it's, uh, you know, there is a certainly a big vacuum there. <coughs> but I, if you know, I wanted to ask Agnes, if from, from the perspective of someone who has dealt with um, the search and return or not return, miss of the <laughs> not return of many libraries in, in Europe, what do you see when, when you look at the situation of the Library of Rome? What are your observations, things that are, you know, um, that you know, not just conjecture, but what do you think of the, the, the work that was done up to this time? It's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> the other big question. Yeah. Well, it's always difficult to judge someone else's research when, you know, we were not there and we have not seen the effort. I can tell you that it's very difficult to start a project because we know so little about uh, so many different issues that relates to the Holocaust, even after 70 years of research. And let not forget that the first 50 years, most of the research uh, dealt with the human loss of, of the lives of the communities, of the community's histories. The research was, were not focused on property uh, and the issues that are uh, more relevant today uh, for many reasons. When uh, whoever returned uh, after the war, their main issue was to restart their lives. Uh, what happened to the community library was a, was a sad part of, of the whole, but they had much more pressing issues than uh, you know, certain amount of manuscripts are missing. So the problem is that at the beginning when the information was there, that information was not collected because there were much more important issues. Um, also, um, the last 50 years, unfortunately, most of the eyewitnesses or those who could have given us information passed away, so they are not around today. And therefore, it's extremely difficult to evaluate certain um, oral history, even if it's the oral history itself is documented because the people are not there to be questioned. And many of these oral histories turns out to be more of an urban legend than, than something that could be substantiated as a fact. And 
some of those that could be substantiated as a fact, we don't believe because it just sounds so far-fetched that uh, no one would believe that that actually happened. Just to give you one example from my work, um, we were told by the then uh, director of the Museum of Fine Art in Hungary in the 50s, or we have an oral history that uh, he talked about in, in company that he saw in 1945, one of the um, a major Courbet work cut out from the frame, put on the hood of a Russian car and, and drove around the city because it was a lying nude and it was a pornographic image and this is how the Russian soldiers passed their time. And uh, everyone thought that yes, it's a great story, but we also knew that at that time that director was uh, heavily drinking and everyone assumed that it's one of those urban legends until we found the artwork in uh, Slovakia in 2000, and actually the story is true. So it's very hard so many years after to decide that some of the completely far-fetched stories or possibilities about the Roman Jewish library is true or not. We will only know if we will follow all the leads. And uh, unfortunately, there are just way too many uh, archives and information to review. So when the research started, obviously they had to start from scratch and they had to check, you know, the basic information. Today we know more, so I think that uh, if there will be a new uh, inquiry, we can do more specific research into specific archives based on what we know today. The other issue is which uh, uh, drastically changed how we do research today is digitalization. Since the Washington Conference in 1998, uh, when there were plans of establishing a super database of all looted assets. We know today that it's not possible digitally to do, but the last 15 years, nevertheless, many archives were digitalized, and although they're not really compatible and it's still difficult to do research, you have a lot of information on the mm -hmm. internet. So for example, you can go on fold three and review uh, a lot of information about uh, the American US forces and, and Italian information online today, which was impossible when the commission started in 2002, you know, it didn't exist. So I think today we are in a much better position to, to do specific research and also to do general research sitting in front of a computer, which adds to another aspect, it's much cheaper today than Absolutely. do research uh, 10, 15 years ago when someone would have had to fly to Washington DC, take a hotel room, spend a long time there. Instead today you can sit at home and review at least part of the archive and then you can make specific projects to review something in 48 hours. So that's another aspect. So I think that we can do much more today than the commission could have done uh, 10 plus years ago. May Thank you. May I add just one thing? Today is easier to stay in, cont in touch with other scholars all, ov all over the world. Since we're beginning uh, to uh, restart, to think to restart, as I said, we are just thinking to restart. We have done, we didn't do nothing at the moment, and there were some articles by Italian newspapers about. Uh, this idea to restart the research and as the articles by Italian newspapers went out, a lot of different people mailed me and Alessandra Di Castro and offered to cooperate with us and told I know something about, I am an expert on this e area. And this was impossible just 10 years ago to stay so in contact with other historians and other scholars all over the world. Uh, if I may add something okay. else, another uh, issue which is helpful today that, for example, uh, the Czech government uh, is willing to allow researchers into their uh, Prague depositories, which has uh, Hebrew manuscripts. So this is something that was not possible 15 years ago. Uh, I'm not sure that you will have more access in the uh, former Soviet Union's archive, but there is a possibility that you can review more things in Belarus today. So uh, certain archives also opening, and but I have to say that some others are closing. So it's always very important that whenever we have access to to an archive, then, then we do the most uh, when it's open, because right. uh, you never know whether you'll have the same chance a few years later. Okay, we have a question here and a question. I uh, was 
wondering whether there are two, two leads. There are two leads that uh, occurred to me, and I don't know if they've been uh, pursued. Uh, they're um, a, a, um, a favorite uh, resting place for many works of this sort has been the Swiss banks. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so whether there, there may be some way to act on, in, uh, to investigate whether something found its way that way. And then, of course, um, a facilitator in this whole thing might have been through um, a, a Rabbi Zolli <laughs> and his daughter, who's, who I believe his daughter is still alive. And uh, she could be, uh, potentially might have some information. Yeah, it's certainly remarkable that uh, Rabbi Zoli was never interviewed or was never w the position. <laughs> he was the r chief rabbi of the community. Uh, but but no, but he was the chief rabbi of the community and converted after the war. And uh, even uh, at the time of these events, uh, the, the, there was a tremendous uh, community tension between him, who was of Eastern yeah. European heritage and uh, had a completely different view of what the German occupation uh, c would, have, would mean for the Jewish community um, than what the, the chief, the, the head of the Italian Jewish community uh, thought, uh, who was uh, a, a man who, was, who had been uh, certainly um, a, a um, hit by, by the racial laws, but uh, had belonged f in, in, to, the, to the Italian establishment and even the fascist establishment, and uh, had some degree of trust in the city in which he had grown up. So it's uh, that tension certainly should be taken into account, and is both the reason why probably Zoli was not asked, but also. A, you know, a strong indicator that there may be um, a story there that uh, that we we will never know. We have a we have Two, a question here. I believe. Just one second. Claude, can you give this lady a w one second to answer the Swiss uh, question? Uh, I don't think that Switzerland today holds large uh, Jewish uh, libraries or archives for many reasons. The way how artwork ended up in Switzerland is not consistent with how the libraries were looted. And also, the Swiss banks and, and depositories held uh, assets that could be sold on an open market. Uh, while an artwork is identifiable, still it has a value even if it's uh, questionable. And in Europe, there are many countries where claims cannot be bought again. So in those countries, these artworks could be uh, bought and sold even today. But in hmm? in it, it's possible. But when you, when you talk about Jewish books and libraries, and especially you know, the Hebrew uh, uh, written works, the, the buyer would be a Jew. And therefore, it's highly uh, unlikely that a Swiss person who wants to make money would be betting on uh, finding a Jew who would buy something from him that was stolen from another Jew. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think, <laughs> I wouldn't think that you know that that would be something that they would be collecting. But again, the main reason is not that. The main reason why I don't think Switzerland would be a, a, a place to do research is that the way how uh, artworks and, and valuables, treasures, ended up in Switzerland is not consistent with how the books were looted and, and where they ended up. We have a Your question. Brief. What archives are closed and what reasons might have there been for that? Well, there was a short period when uh, you could do research in the Ukraine. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do that today. Uh, there was a period when you could do research in, even in Moscow. Um, one of the, the interesting anecdotes is of why, for example, certain books would be uh, uh, not published on an official uh, uh, library uh, uh, list is uh, not only because it would be trophy art, for example, uh, in the Soviet Union, one of the reasons why a large part of the Breslau manuscripts were not listed at the Russian library was that they contained documents about the 
Jewish grandfather of Karl Marx. And in itself was a sufficient reason to keep these books off the official uh, reading list, even for Russian leaders. So you have all sorts of reasons why certain archives are not you know, published or, or books are not published that they are at certain libraries. History changes and then uh, certain issues are not so sensitive anymore. You would see this problem between, for example, Poland and Ukraine of uh, what they admit to have and what they don't admit to have. So um, again, uh, what you can access in a library today and what you can tomorrow, unfortunately, is changing back and forth. in a little bit to ask you how you characterize the difference between the rabbinical college library and the community library. How, how are they different and was one more valuable than the other? Uh, it's hard to speak about value. They are really different because of the origin, due to the origin of the two libraries. The Rome Jewish Community Library uh, was uh, made uh, unifying the older libraries of the ghetto. The uh, mm, uh, Rabbinical College Library was originated in Padova when the Rabbinical College was founded. And uh, the Rabbinical College was founded at the beginning of the 18th century, of the 19th century, sorry. And uh, it was uh, the University for Future Rabbi that was founded in Padova. There are a lot of uh, interesting essays, essays about this important institution that cooperated with uh, uh, the Republic of Venice uh, uh, du during the Risorgimento, uh, uh, during the Risorgimento, sorry, <laughs> during the Risorgimento, and then when Italy was uni had been unified, the, the library of the Collegio Rabbinico of Padova was moved before to Florence, and then. Uh, to Rome. So it was a very different library because uh, it has at least uh, printed books and not manuscripts books, uh, and it has uh, um, books uh, useful for uh, uh, teaching to a rabbi to become a rabbi, and it's really different from uh, her historical, historical collection uh, dating back to the Middle Ages. Okay, we have a last question here. Looking into uh, stolen art, uh, I read the Anselmi Commission report and was astonished at their approach. The Anselmi Commission, looking to see if Italian uh, art galleries had any stolen art, consulted all of the police uh, in Italy to determine whether anything was stolen. What they did not do was look at any museum, and they specifically said they had not looked at the collections of any museum, which, to my American way of looking things, would be the obvious route uh, to finding stolen property. That may well be the same with respect to the books. Thank you, I think that's a good uh, question and... Well, uh, one possible answer, if I may, is that uh, most Italian museums do not acquire, they don't buy. Like the major museums like the Uffizi and Pitti, by statute, they show the holdings that come to them from the original founding family, in this case the Medici and the legato of Anna Maria Ludovica, the last descendant that endowed the collections of the city. So most Italian museums, and we know that most of them are state-run museums, don't actually even have a buying office. They don't acquire new art. That may be a reason why the Assembly Commission didn't look into it. That well, also, there is another possible. issue that in Italy there was no restitution policy. So uh, the Commission knew that uh, the report would have no, no um, concrete consequence. And uh, let's say that both uh, the research of the victims and later, very late in, uh, in history, the research on assets um, had to overcome a very profound taboo. I mean, Italians thought that Jews had never been persecuted in Italy. So that, that taboo certainly made 
um, the, the research rather difficult, if I may say. I like to suggest that we continue the conversation upstairs with a, a drink and uh, some yeah, delicious uh, uh, burekes that our friend uh, uh, Paola made for us. And <laughs> I thank our speakers. I thank Casa Italiana Zarili Marimo. Uh, I'd like to say that this seminar was uh, um, organized in collaboration with the Jewish Museum of Rome on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the Center for Contemporary Jewish Documentation in Milan, which is one of the first uh, research center on the Holocaust established in Europe uh, after the French one. And uh, all programs of this year were co-sponsored with the Consulate General of Italy and the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Thank you very much. Thank you.